Acton, Acton, and welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans with my great old pal, Rob Satino, uh, once voted the greatest history professor in the whole of the United States. That's right. Um, the resident historian at the National World War II Museum down in New Orleans. Well, J James, it's just great to be here. Uh, you and I have been friends for a long time, and I think this is even going to deepen our relationship. So uh, thanks for signing me up. <laughs> the um, National World War II Museum, and if, if anyone hasn't been there, you really should. It's, um, if you're ever in the, in the U.S. or if you're ever down uh, Louisiana Way and down, down near the ocean in New Orleans, then go and check it out because it's an incredible museum. I mean, an inspirational place. But but over the years since it's um, well actually Rob you should tell us a little bit about the history of the museum it's, it's Stephen Ambrose isn't it and Nick Mueller they're they're the founders so um, we are here in New Orleans Louisiana and uh, in 1990 a couple of history professors at the University of New Orleans one uh, Gordon Nick Mueller um, a, a brilliant guy in terms of organizational acumen and his best pal uh, Stephen Ambrose an extraordinary uh, historian and perhaps the best-known American historian of the of the 20th century. You know, they got together, and, and they, they, they liked to get together after work and ha have a drink, maybe. And uh, after a couple of glasses of sherry, so the legend goes, uh, they decided that what New Orleans needed was a museum to D-Day. And let me, let me explain, James. Why D-Day in New Orleans? And, of, of course, it's the great shipbuilder, Andrew Higgins. Yeah. The designer of the amphibious of landing course. craft, um, LCVPs. They have various initials, but perhaps better known as the Higgins boat. And so, uh, you know, these are the amphibious landing craft, James. The, the ramp comes down and the men charge off, hopefully to glory, but sometimes to, to disaster. And it could go both ways, of course, as we've seen in World War II. But those Higgins boats, you know, they really played a material role in the Allied victory. So, so these two professors start a, start a museum uh, to D-Day. Um, the idea catches on. Stephen Ambrose is interviewing a lot of veterans of D-Day. It's the, the 80s, of course, of the 40th anniversary of those signal events in June. I, I, those, I, I would say that long ago decade of the 1980s. But Stephen and, and Nick then um, putting together this, this museum to D-Day, and it really just took off from there. There's an old saying, you know, about build it and they will come. Uh, Nick likes to say that if, if we had ever taken a market survey, we might never build this museum. We just built it and made it excellent and felt that people would respond to it. Now, the, the, the one big change, James, I will uh, add before I, I send it back to you. The one big change is that very early on, it became evident that the museum needed to broaden its mission, that D-Day was great, but people were saying, you've got to tell the story of the whole war. And the museum got congressional uh, uh, declaration to do just that, a congressional a statement that this is the National World War II Museum. So it's, we're, you know, we're only a little over 20 years old, so we're still in the first bloom of uh, adulthood. Um, very, very active, uh, very exciting place to be. And when you come to work in the morning, you're never quite sure what you're going to be working on that day, which kind of is a special sauce. Well, I, I mean, it's an amazing place to visit. And it sort of straddles over a kind of a whole little neighborhood, really, of New Orleans, doesn't it? And certainly kind of across the road and you've got these different halls and, you know, you go into one big hall. And there's a B-17 strung from the from the ceiling and a, uh, you know, and a Mustang and, and, and I think it's a Thunderbolt, if I remember rightly. And you know, they have all these incredible displays, but, but it's like a lot of these places, it's like the Imperial War Museum or, or National Army Museum. It's a kind of the tip of the night of the iceberg, isn't it? Because you've got a huge amount of archives. Because I, I guess, you know, Stephen Ambrose and, um, was doing all these interviews with veterans, and, and that's a great part of your archive, all these recorded interviews and stuff. But, but people just send stuff in, don't they? Yeah, so the, uh, the jewel of our crown, James, is, is our collection of now, I, I want to say, nearly 12,000 taped interviews with veterans. Some audio tapes, Stephen Ambrose in the early days on, on audio cassette, if our listeners remember that delivery yeah, system. Yeah, I remember doing those. Yep. But, but now on high-definition digital video. And, and so yep. we have um, just about 12,000 of those interviews. Wow. And not only is it the voice of, of a generation, perhaps the greatest generation, as some people call yes. it, but it's a precious heritage and a precious resource for, for uh, future researchers. And we're very, very proud of that. But, you know, alongside that, that oral history archive, we're a museum. We've got... We've got artifacts big and small. You already gave away all my great material by mentioning the B-17. We have a the Boeing Center here at uh, on campus. Um, there's a B-17 strung from the 
ceiling. And, you know, I, I walk to work every day and I, I walk through that building and, and uh, I've been here five years now. Sometimes I forget and I look up and say, holy cow, B-17 right over my head. There's a Corsair. There's a Dauntless dive bomber. There's a P-51 Mustang in the colors of the uh, 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 of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, it's we, we've we've got the big artifacts. We've got small artifacts. We've got flight jackets. We've got Norden bomb sites. We have an Enigma machine. We, we, we have it all. We have letters from soldiers home to their parents and letters from parents over to their soldier and just about everything you could possibly imagine. Our curators are really ace. So what are we, what are we going to be looking at? What's your, what is your artifact for today? Well, the artifact for today is uh, always, for me, one of the most emotionally affecting. And, it, and you wouldn't really know it at first to look at it. If it wasn't labeled, you might not even know that. It's a, it's a chunk of steel off the hull of the USS Arizona. Wow. Now, our, our listeners, I'm sure we have, a, we have listeners who already know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the Arizona went up very, very early on in the Pearl Harbor attack, uh, almost the initial strike. Um, yeah, settled. this is the magazine hitting, isn't it? The, 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 the uh, big bomb hit the forward ammunition magazine. The ship immediately went to the bottom and, and took uh, nearly 1,200 sailors with it. Um, that's, you know, just about, a little less, give or take, it's just about half of all the Americans who were killed at Pearl Harbor. Now, the ship, many ships were raised from the bottom at Pearl Harbor that were sunk. The, the Arizona presented special problems um, in, in getting it up. The ship probably would have come apart. Um, it was deemed also that it would not be possible to retrieve the dead from the Arizona in any you know fitting and, and dignified manner. And, and so um, and many of our listeners perhaps have already visited. The USS Arizona is not simply a military site to visit. It's a, it's a memorial, and it is also a, a mass grave site of U.S. military personnel. The ship still weeps tears of oil into the surrounding waters if, if you visit it and the, the light strikes the water the right way you can still see the still see the oil leak so so the arizona so this to me this james this is what it's all about at a museum you have a chunk of steel and that, it is what it is and you look at it and you might not think twice but when when then you're given a little backstory of just what it is we're looking at you know how did that chunk of steel get ripped off the arizona what were those Japanese aircraft doing in the skies over Pearl Harbor? What did they think they were doing? What, what, how, what, what had relations been like between the two states before Pearl Harbor? You know, uh, our, our friend, we never met him, James, but Carl von Clausewitz, the great philosopher of war in the 19th century, said war is about politics. It's an extension of politics by other means. And here was, a, here was an extension of politics, you know. 400 Japanese aircraft appearing suddenly overhead over the U.S. fleet of Pearl Harbor, which was hopelessly unready in a tactical sense to, to resist that attack. And it just, to me, it, it, it's, a, it's a piece of steel that, that encapsulates the entire Pearl Harbor story. And, and it's, it's, I mean, the Arizona is a super dreadnought, isn't it? So it's, it's one of those kind of, it's, it's a First World War, uh, World War One era um, battleship, pretty massive, and, it, and it's in size for the time i think it's uh when's it it's a 1915 or so isn't it it's being launched yeah i don't have that that information at, at my beck and call necessarily i don't mention the launch i don't memorize the launching dates of our super dreadnoughts but, but it's, a, it's it's in the style you but did, it's but, that kind of a, but it yeah, is okay. it's well, so look it's that, it was it's that kind of at the time at the time in december 1941 still it was uh, ships like the Arizona were the uh, uh, were the, the way you determined your naval strength. Uh, you counted right. how many dreadnought battleships you had, all big gun battleships, uh, heavily armored uh, battle wagons that could go go anywhere and and do anything. Could lay fifteen miles offshore and right. pulverize you, you know, with, without you without even being in range of your own land based guns. It, it was uh, naval when you look, strength. And when you sorry, and when you look at when you look at these battleships, I mean, just say you're kind of you, you know you're standing on the edge of the harbor and the kind of you know the Arizona sails in, you cannot be but awed by its scale, can you? I mean, the, these are huge ships. No, I think that's um, we tend to read history a little bit backwards when we're discussing things like Pearl Harbor, and we say, well, everyone knows, everyone knows that it was the the aircraft carrier that was now the new arbiter of of, uh, of battle at sea. But the right. point is, no one knew that yet. That was uh, that remained to that be demonstrated. To yeah, that was yeah. still to come. And so, um, what you have here in the Arizona is is perhaps the you know, the, in a sense, the kind of 
culmination of a specific kind of technology that had once ruled the waves. So uh, I'm uh, I'm recalling now it is I want to say 1916 the Arizona was uh, was laid down, uh, and so you're talking about a World War One piece of technology. But for all that, when the Arizona sailed past you or when any of those big all-gun battleships sailed past you between 1920 and 1940, you sat up and took notice. You were looking at the giants of the ocean. Right. And, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can see kind of lots of soldiers lined up and you can see lots of tanks lined up. But if you want to kind of get a sense of military scale... You can't beat the Navy because they have the biggest beasts, right? You know, the biggest a absolutely. physical and, beasts. Yeah, so it, uh, um, I'm a treadhead, by, by which I mean I love looking at tanks and talking about tanks and writing about tanks. But when it comes to sort of apogee of military technology in the first half of the 20th century, it's these gigantic naval vessels. Frankly, it's, it still is. I, I was in San Diego recently, and, you know, I was on board the USS Midway, an aircraft carrier. Wow. And you don't know you're on a boat. <laughs> you don't know you're at sea. You don't know you're on a ship. It feels like you're walking through a gigantic foundry or a gigantic industrial facility or factory. And, of course, that's precisely what these things are. And that is precisely why the loss of one of them, let alone five or six or seven or eight or nine, as happened to the United States. It's mega news. Pearl Harbor. It's mega news, isn't it? It's, it's mega news. It's mega bad news uh, again i think we say well the japanese just hit the battleships and they did miss the aircraft carriers it's a true that's of course true but hitting the battleships was bad enough and if you have a complement of 1200 men on board and the ship goes to the bottom within minutes uh, you have a human catastrophe as well yeah of course i, I suppose what I'm, I'm 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 interested in is this sort of no, you know America between the two wars has been isolationist, of course. Um, it's had a, a, a deliberately pared down armed forces. And the whole point of that is that, you know, if you have a small armed forces, you tend not to use them. And, and obviously the, the opposite is true, that if you have a large armed forces, you tend to use them. And I guess, you know, history ever since the, the end of end of World War Two would would absolutely testify to that that hypothesis. But OK. America might have been a little bit inward looking in the 1920s and 1930s, but it still has its Navy. You know, the Navy is the one bit that is quite strong. And do you think there is there is there a sense of Americans uh, um, being proud of their Navy? Is is it considered to be the kind of the safety net? You know, OK, we may not need a kind of a big army or a big air force, but we've got our Navy and, and we're a two ocean front country. And, you know, and, and we've got our territories out in the Pacific. So, you know, we're OK because we've got this huge Navy. Is that is there a sense of that or am I barking up the wrong tree on that? No, I don't think you're barking up the wrong tree at all. I, I, I think it's not just the Navy, James. It's also what you just added there in the course of your um, uh, uh, talk. It's that ocean on both sides. You know, the United States had a moat. Two of them. Yes. Castles have moats. And the United States, you know, God or Providence or geography has given the United States two of the greatest moats in the world. One's called Atlantic and one's called Pacific. Of course, those moats are precisely what uh, led to the origins of what we might call the I word, isolationism. Those moats are what uh, kept up, uh, what uh, contributed to the persistence of isolationism all to this era. Let Europe stew in its own juices we already did that once from 1917 to 1918. We don't want to get involved in this again. We have nothing to show for that, or very little to show for that one. You know, the economy was never put back together globally. Markets were never reestablished. Extremists rose all over the continent. And then I think for, for the Americans, people, not usually interested, all that interested in foreign affairs, what the Japanese were doing in China could be a little bit difficult to conjure. What, what are those place names? For most Americans, know very little about East Asian geography. So, so it's the it's the it's the existence of those oceans and those moats. But, but I would go further and say yes. We say that 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 the American military atrophied in the 1920s. The army was tiny. It, you know, you were stuck in some. No offense to anybody, Podunk garrison somewhere opportunities within the army because it was so small opportunities for any sort of advancement and promotion were, were were nearly nil and so yes all that is true but what isn't true is that somehow the navy had atrophied the, the navy was still one of the most modern services in the world right 
th- there were agreements that it was one it of had the largest pa- navies in the world. Yes, uh, had parity with the British. I mean, wh- James, what is the gold standard for naval strength over the course of centuries? Yeah. It's it's the Royal Navy, of course, and America <laughs> had parity with the Royal Navy uh, and, and had uh, had a. Uh, uh, superiority by treaty arrangement, the so-called Washington Treaty, had superiority over the Japanese. So th- there's not much chance of an adversary sailing into American coastal waters and landing an amphibious force. Put put it that way. Um, and yeah. and of course, okay, so that bit's that yeah. bit secured. So you're safe on that front because yeah. the navy is just sufficiently big enough that you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a pretty good book written about U.S. military reform. Uh, not pretty good book, very good book about U.S. military reform in the in the 1920s and 30s, and it's called Fast Tanks and Heavy Bombers. So we were we were trying to reform our our land force and and trying right. to build a, a kind of a, a air arm, an air strike arm. But at the same time, I, while new ships and new designs are coming off the you know drawing boards all the time, I think U.S. naval strength was was in great shape. Even, even building aircraft carriers, you know, we're in the forefront. America was in the forefront. Yeah, I was going to go on to onto the aircraft carriers, but just you know, what, one last point about about the uh, the battleships. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, the criticism has been laid at the British and the and the Royal Navy. It's like you know, you got all these kind of First World War battleships. I mean, you know, you might have had the largest navy in 1939, but you're really out of date and all the rest of it. It's like, no, I don't think so. Because what you've got to realize is is that these things are up. You know, these things are upgraded all the time. And, and OK, so, so the hull might have been laid down in, you know, 1914 or 1916 or whenever uh, and might have been um, first sailing the seas in, in World War One. But by 1939, 1941, you know, it's it's a completely different beast. You know, yeah, it's been so, upgraded. And the, and the USS Arizona is no exception. It's been no. upgraded in 1929 to 1931. And, and that is it's almost like a new ship in terms of kind of, you know, guns it's got the technology it's it, it's basically it's up to date isn't it it's, it's yeah. a it's a it's a modern battleship even it's, though it was laid down earlier it's got new fire fire control systems uh mm-hmm. it's it's got um a, a reduced number of the smaller guns they were repositioned it's got right. eight 25 caliber five inch anti-aircraft guns there's your yeah. there's your sign of modernity, of course, James. In the in the twenties, everyone recognized that you know you're, the, at sea ships were going to have to deal with with the threat from the air. So the deck armor is thickened. You know the, you, everything you can uh, possibly think of to make a ship sort of seaworthy for the nineteen thirties. Let me just say this: you spend so much money on a battleship. Yeah, of course. You don't just scrap it at the with the first time somebody you know makes a better five inch gun. You don't just scrap your battleships. You, no, of course not. You 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 take out the guns, put in new guns. You you do what you can to keep it up to up to square because it's a major capital investment. It's a major investment of manpower. It's a a major portion of your military strength. I mean, if you have ten, let's say you have ten battleships. Um, you, you may have a lot more divisions than that, right? right? I mean, you might have 80 divisions. I don't know. You might have 55 divisions and 10 battleships or five battleships or three battleships. And I, I think it, it tells us just where the battleship stands, again, as a kind of metric right. of military power. The U.S. Navy does also have aircraft carriers, and it's one of very, very few countries in the world to have this. And I kind of sort of liken it in a little bit of a, uh, to, to kind of, you know, nations getting a, a kind of a nuclear armament post-war. You know, it's only a special few have it. You know, it's 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 a rare beast. And aircraft carriers are the you know they may well be the coming thing, but but they're still pretty darn new, aren't they? Yeah, there, there's there's no doubt. Uh, people have been working with them and testing them, and and, and our friends uh, once again in the Royal Navy ha- have even had pretty good success against the Italians. Um, the Italian Navy at a port called Taranto. Um, so there's been some experience um, of of how they might work. There's advocates, as always, when new weapon system comes out, James, there's a sort of fanatics <laughs> who claim that the, that these weapons have completely revolutionized the, uh, uh, modern warfare. They've said it about the tank. They said it about the aircraft carrier. They said it in 1973 about the new handheld anti-tank guided missiles or, or, or even uh, shaped charges that the a- Arabs were using against the Israeli army. Uh, now they're saying it about cyber. So there's, the new weapon systems always have their, their advocates. But, you know, in the course of the aircraft carrier, I, I think they were right uh, that ships used to have to close to some kind of range for a super dreadnought, 15 miles. Uh, and you could then start laying down main gunfire. But aircraft carriers didn't have to get anywhere near 15 miles. They could reach out and touch you from hundreds of miles away, of course, with their aircraft. And in fact, if they did get within range, they were in a, they were in big trouble. They were in a world of hurt. So this is... 
this revolutionizes in, uh, naval warfare and perhaps could only have been f- brought to its full fruition in the broad reaches of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's, it seems to me that, you know, the you're not, carrier warfare in the English Channel is kind of a oxymoron. Well, not I even think sure the Royal Navy, they launched, it, some, yeah. they launched some planes, and I think in early 1918 on, on some uh, Zeppelin bases in, in what is now northern Denmark, but at the time was uh, still part of Schleswig-Holstein or something. Um, sure. So I seem to remember that, that, you know, that was the first ever aggressive launch of aircraft from a ship. But... By World War Two, it's a it's a completely different beast, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, suddenly you've got these huge, you know, you've got the Hornet, you've got the the Wasp. I think is in by this time, isn't it? Maybe, but but I mean, yes. you know, it's it, it's it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? And so, suddenly there is this yeah, so, scope for kind of making aircraft carriers seriously big. Yeah. So so there's there's no doubt the the December seventh, nineteen forty one, the the U.S. Navy had seven aircraft carriers, and I think a and also a so called aircraft escort vessel right. in uh, in in commission. So that's seven aircraft carriers. You know, with with that that adds up to hundreds of aircraft. The Japanese have six, uh, and and they will uh, you know famously employ all six of those in that Pearl Harbor strike. So it's six aircraft carriers and. And that's 400 aircraft in the sky at once. It's a tremendous uh, uh, aggregate. Of, well, I, 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 I totally strength. agree. And, and you know, we're used in retrospect to kind of understanding huge, great bomber raids of, you know, a thousand bombers, 1200 bombers, you know, three and a half thousand bombers that flatten Hamburg at the end of July, beginning of August 1943 and so on. But, you know, the height of the Battle of Britain, for example, you know, Battle of Britain Day, 15th of September 1940, the most bombers that are in the air on any one time on that day are 100. The biggest Luftwaffe formation is 300. You know, that's that seems like enormous. So to launch 400 from the Pacific Ocean on on uh, on Hawaii is is an extraordinary feat. Anyway, listen, I'm, we're we're going to take a short break there, and when we come back, let's. I want to look at the kind of the shock of it. You know, how, what effect does Pearl Harbor have? Why didn't the Americans see it coming? And what are the lessons learned? We've been talking about it since 1941. Let's do it. <laughs> Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with the National World War II Museum with me, James Holland, and with Rob Satino in New Orleans. And we're talking the USS Arizona and we're talking Pearl Harbor and generally doing a kind of sort of pretty broad brush cud chew. So, Rob, before we before the break, we were we, we were sort of ruminating on aircraft carriers and, and um, the scale of, of the, the, the super dreadnoughts and the U.S. Navy and all the rest of it. I mean, I, I suppose we all know that Pearl Harbor was was a shock, but it, but it is a super shock, isn't it? I mean, no one really sees it coming. And I know there's conspiracy theories about this, but th- that's all bulls, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the Americans absolutely were, were caught short on this. Yes. Um. So uh, I, I, you know, we we can uh, disregard the conspiracy theories yes. from from the beginning. Um, the, the fact that there is no real evidence, you know, for the conspiracy theories is only proof for the proof that the conspiracy runs deeper. Uh, it's difficult to argue with 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 anyone who, who believes those things. But, yeah, the shock was total. Um, I, I don't think, uh, James, that the, the shock of a Japanese strike on a U.S. installation was total. I, I, I think that relations between the two countries had been had become so bad uh, to, to the degree of, you know, embargoes on on uh, on japanese on, on sale of arms to the japanese and aviation fuel and and uh, Im- Im- freezing of japanese assets within the united states making it impossible for japan to buy oil we, we uh, the american administration of fdr was trying desperately to get japan to halt its aggression in china um you know so relations were about as bad as you could get so the, the thought that japan went to war against the united states i don't think is completely shocking I think that you could ask many U.S. officials and say, yeah, yeah, we're going to get a Japanese attack one of these days. Then they pause and say, it'll be the Philippines. You know, the Philippines would be the logical place, um, an, Amer- an actual American possession, big islands the Japanese could use and, and exploit for, for labor and raw materials and all the other things they were trying to do in their drive to empire. But I think 
What was a shock was that any country would take all six of its precious fleet carriers, put them together into one task force, sail them across 3,000 miles of open ocean in the northern, you know, the, the, the nor northern Pacific, anchor a couple hundred miles off Oahu north, and, and, and then strike south suddenly with the concentrated might of all those aircraft. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's a the thing, isn't bargain. it? I mean, it, it's such yeah. an audacious attack because there's quite a lot yeah. of room for cock-up from their part, isn't there? It's a colossal I gamble. Mean, you know, and if, uh, and if you get that wrong, yeah. I mean, jeepers, you're yeah. in real, real trouble, aren't you? Yeah, let's say you have a collision at sea. Uh, you know, it's not like there are repair facilities in the northern Pacific. Let's say a typhoon blows up. I am no meteorologist, and I, I you know, I defer to anyone who can give me the weather charts for, for the northern Pacific in, in December 1941. That's fine. But almost anything can go wrong at sea. N naval warfare is inherently dangerous, even if there's no enemy next to you. <laughs> you're at sea. You're at the mercy of the elements. You're a long, long way from home and support or w whatever you might need. Well, yes, because 3,000 miles, in a basket. 3, miles is a long distance today. It's, it, it's an even longer distance in 1941, isn't it? Well, you know, we, we famously say the, the globe has been shrinking in the 20th and 21st century, and I, I get that. The fact that you and I are speaking across the Atlantic right now says something about the shrinking of the globe. 3,000 miles is a long way today, but 3,000 miles was a colossal distance by, by the standards of the 1940s. It shows, by the way, even in the first minutes of the Pacific War, that is specifically the war between Japan and the United States with uh, British allies and Australian allies as well. But it shows even in the first minutes of the Pacific War, this was going to be an unusual war that was going to operate at distances that were heretofore unknown. And so required different methods, different machines, different methods of, of planning, different different sort of ideas, a different mindset about how to launch war across thousands of miles of open ocean. It could only have been done, James, with aircraft carriers. Yeah, that's that's true. But also um, with huge, unbelievably complex logistical support. And and that's one of the things that I think is is one of the biggest miracles of of the U.S. performance in the Pacific is how they managed to keep all that stuff going. And, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, as in, as in the war against Nazi Germany, so is the case in 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 Japan with Japan you know it's it's once once you don't get the lightning strike completely successful i mean you know the german attack on france and the low countries is 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 pretty successful but nothing less than complete victory will do and and it's not a complete victory because britain's still in the war you know nothing less than a complete victory um on the attack of pearl harbor will do because they need to buy themselves considerable time with uh, with the us navy knocked out of the war and that doesn't happen because those aircraft carriers uh, are not there and because the U.S. Navy is huge. Uh, and, you know, in fact, actually, rather than knocking it out, they've, they've stored the, the the hornet's nest. And one of the things that, you know, we were talking, um, Al and I were talking to um, uh, a brilliant, hist a brilliant um, British historian called Rob Lyman the other day. And he was making the point that, that you know, from, from the Japanese point of view, um, this is year four of their war, <laughs> you know, so they're already broke. And one of the reasons they're having to go to such extremes is because they are already on their uppers. They can't afford the long kind of attritional um, war and they don't have the resources to support um, an island hopping Pacific campaign in the same way that the Americans do. But what the Americans do from, you know, they, they've obviously got the big US Navy, but what they've managed to kind of, uh, assemble in pretty quick order is the ability to maintain that effort out at sea uh, and that is just uh, that's an astonishing thing uh, and it is it is it is the operational brilliance of the united states in the second world war that kind of really wins the day isn't it well i don't think there's any doubt about that um sometimes americans get a little edgy when you say you know just you were real rich and you had all these resources but you know resources have to be marshaled right they just sit, they, they sit somewhere somebody has to you know, put them into a pipeline. We're famously uh, all over the globe right now talking about, oh, pipeline disruptions and logistical yes. disruptions. You know, here in New Orleans, we had a run a couple of weeks ago on ketchup and just couldn't find it for love or money on the, <laughs> or the shelves of our grocery stores. And so we're all, I think, a bit more attuned to logistics. I, I, I think it's possible to say, I don't think I'm taking too much credit as an American, to say that America kind of invented logistics. Yes. It's a science and it's a pipeline. And the, it's not just, oh, we have this, let's ship it there. It, it, there has to be various stages. Something always has to be in the pipeline. And you have to make sure that what comes out of the pipeline at the other end is what those troops need most, not what they need least. If they're in 
uh, if they're in gritty, nitty gritty island infantry combat, they need ammunition. They need bandages. They need medicine. You know, they don't need a Boston cream pie or, or right, whatever right, right. else might be might be shipped. So a lot of planning has to go into this. You know, it's the uh, I have to say this: the U.S. Army, George Marshall, always talking about uh, logistics and. Now, Admiral Ernest King in the Navy once said, "What's this logistics?" Marshall's always talking about. I want to get some of that. <laughs> like, it was, like logistics was something you could you could purchase off of a, off of a shelf. Um, but you know, uh, James, you covered so much uh, great material as as you were just speaking a, a moment ago. Japan needed. It's funny. You said Japan needed a total victory at Pearl Harbor. It needed a decisive blow because it couldn't get involved in an attritional war. It already was. It's already in an attritional war. That's the point. And it's it's uh, you're. It's been an attritional war for four long years. It's uh, four and a half years since Japan launched a, what we might say, a full-scale invasion of China proper, yep. this famous Marco Polo Bridge incident. It looked like an easy and rapid victory. The Japanese certainly thought so. They have contempt for their Chinese adversary, sort of on, on racial and cultural grounds. Always a, always a danger if you're a military planner to underestimate your enemy. Let me just say that. They gotten bogged down, and they needed resources to finish that war, and they, they, they could get them. Because Hitler had overrun all these European powers who had all these wealthy colonies. The Dutch East Indies, it's Indonesia today, it's just a repository of, of, of oil. It's one of the world's you know, greatest suppliers of oil. And that's what the Japanese really need. But they need tin from Malaya. They need the rubber of Indochina and, again, oil from, from the Dutch East Indies. It's time to seize those colonies, the Japanese say. Well, it's not the birthright of, you know, of white Europeans to rule Indonesia. But there's just one power standing in the way, and that power is the United States. And you got to knock the United States at least back. You don't knock the United States out. Nobody in Japan thought anyone was you know, going to march through Washington. But you had to knock the Americans back on their heels, give Japanese forces time enough to build this huge resource-rich empire. And then fortify it, and let the Americans knock their heads out on it until they got tired. But that was the plan. That's the plan, but it, but uh, it goes know, badly uh, wrong on day one, doesn't it? That that is the bottom line, and, it, and and we can say that in retrospect. I'm sure it didn't seem quite so much um, at the time, but but certainly within six months, you know, the, those those amazing four minutes at the Battle of Midway, you know, the whole picture completely changes and then you have Guadalcanal and one of the things about Guadalcanal is you know it starts off with with only a handful of, of U.S. Marine Corps troops being landed you know it's under resourced it's all a bit touch and go you know the the Japanese then kind of sort of land back and you know there's a the, there's little bits of ding dogs but really it, it is although those Marines feel completely abandoned for a little while and you have those incredible naval engagements um, just off the off the the shore of Guadalcanal. By the end of the year, well, no, even by the kind of by kind of sort of November time, the tide is absolutely turning because the Americans prove that they can supply their troops and their resources much better than the Japanese can, and, 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 yeah, and there you have the secret. You know, uh, and, yeah, and no, it, I, it I, is I, the do I, the dogged ferocity. Um, and determination of those first people that are touched down on, uh, you know, in, in whenever it is, July 19, 1940, 42. But it is, it, it, you know, what wins the wins the island completely in February 1943 uh, 40, um, 40, is, is that logistical support. Uh, and you see that the Americans are completely getting their their shit together, and uh, that is a that is a war winning formula. I mean, I love it, James. I, I we should get a U.S. Marine in here and ask if he thought the Americans had their shit together in August of 1942 when they first landed. Well, As you may know, absolutely not. But but but, but yeah. they, it's 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 that speed of assimilation of of what you need to do, problem solving, and acting on that. That, that I find it is absolutely astonishing about the US. I mean, you know, and, and we can go back to kind of, you know, June 1940, France falls, Roosevelt getting his 20 billion or whatever it is. Um, you know, from having that very small army, from having 74 fighter planes, you know, in, in 18 months, you're you're in a position where you can sort of, you know, meaningfully contribute to a world war. Um, with a further 18 months on, you're kind of leading the world. And, and that's, that is some growth. I mean, that that is truly exponential and it, and it's and you, and you don't do that by just having you know people working in factories you have people who've got vision who understand what the problems are and how to solve them and and that's that's a whole different ball game that that's not just factories that's that's something more 
Yeah, I, I, I'm with you 100%. It's, it's easy to say, well, America had an economy that was eight times the size of, of Japan's. So that doesn't win a war. Economies, you know, the economies are crucial. I guess but that's Economies my point. have to be, yeah, p- potential power has to be turned into real power. You know, and, and so I think America proved very adept at that. But look, I'll just say this. The Guadalcanal was at the extreme limit of virtually uh, both sides' logistical reach. <laughs> um, the Americans often, you know, r- r- thought of it as kind of an improvisation. It, w- we had seized the initiative at Midway, and you never want to give up the initiative. And what's the target of opportunity? Well, we could probably get forces to Guadalcanal. Um, and it's just a, it, it's a fantastic sort of come-as-you-are fight. And it's, it's, a, it's in the balance for the first month, two months. And then gradually, um, uh, America is able to ship more, ship more replacements, get more actual naval strength, get a, a greater degree of ammunition, higher levels of ammunition, and, and gradually begins to, to, to win an advantage. But, boy, what a tough fight. If I, if I sound like I might be choking up a bit, my father was on Guadalcanal no. um, at, with the Army, not, not a Marine. Yeah. He was U.S. Army, AmeriCal yeah, Division, so yeah. he came a little later. Platoon sergeant and a medic, and I can only imagine wow. things a medic saw on, on Guadalcanal. Well, but Thin you know, Red um, Line, one of my my favorite films of all time. Um, yeah, um, know, I, I, I know film um, there. My father, yeah, my father was uh, my father talked about Guadalcanal his whole life when I was a kid. Mm. Even hearing the words Guadalcanal it just rolled off the tongue. It sounded like the end of the earth somewhere. Which, of course, if you're growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, in the industrial yeah, north yeah. Of, of the United States, Guadalcanal is the end of the earth. But I, I like the point you're making, James. That it's a, yeah, it, it's th- there's a saying that amateurs talk about you know maneuvers and and generals and bold strokes, but but professionals discuss logistics. And <laughs> nobody could have done anything on on Guadalcanal if 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 the logistics weren't there. And definitely America proved that it had the edge, and it's going to be an edge that's only going to increase for the rest of the Pacific War. Well, there you go. We start off with a little piece of rusting steel, and we end up talking about logistics on Guadalcanal. That's my kind of Second World War chit-chat, I can tell you. So, uh, (laughs) We just chewed the cud. We just had a cud chew. We had a cud chew. I'd heard that phrase, and I'm going to start using it all the time now, James. Yeah, we've had a cud chew, so that's great. Well, listen, Rob, um, great to see you. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, We'll see you next time. Cheerio.